Here we're going to go through the simple model of reinforcement learning, the temporal differences reinforcement learning model. This model simulates at first just a very simple CSUS sequence. So the event is the individual sort of step level. What we see is after 10 steps of time, a light that just came on here. So what we are coding here in the input layer is stimuli at different points in time. So the horizontal axis here are different time steps and then the axis going back in depth here is uh, different stimulus features. So we're allowing for earlier time steps uh, so we can look at something called second order conditioning when we have a stimulus that precedes another stimulus but for now, we're just gonna look at this stimulus coming on at time step 10. Uh, and then as we continue to step through here, we see that a reward occurs now at uh, time step 15. The key thing we wanna look at in this model is how the reward drives learning to predict the onset of that reward next time through uh, in the uh, reward prediction system. So here we have kind of the primary reward, reward represented here. RuPred is the layer that does the learning and gets inputs from uh, this input stimulus layer. This is called the complete serial compound that kind of contains separate units for each moment in time and each different type of stimulus. Um, and interestingly, the TD framework generally requires some kind of model like this, which is a little bit implausible, but otherwise uh, it's another topic. Okay, what we want to look at right now is the learning that took place in response to this unexpected reward that just came on uh, at time step 15. So we can look at our D weight and we click on the RuPred unit and what you can see is, very interestingly, that the unit that was active just prior to that um, time step is the one that actually gets the increase in synaptic weight. And the reason for this, and this is the absolute essential feature of how TD works, is that essentially the unexpected thing that happens at like time t drives learning at t minus one, the prior time step, in order to now predict more accurately what happens at time t. And so you could also write it in terms of time t and time t plus one, you know, going into the future, but it's simpler to just say, when something unexpected happens at, some, at a moment in time t, you now need to sort of do a better job of predicting that by changing your expectations at time t minus one. And that's exactly what we're seeing. The uh, synaptic weight has now been increased from this stimulus that's present at time t minus one. And so what that means is that when we go through this whole sequence of inputs again, um, and we see uh, again the time kind of stepping across here, at that t minus one time step, in other words, time step 14 now, we're getting the stimulus. It previously did not activate anything in these kind of reward uh, layers, but now because of that synaptic weight change, it is driving a prediction of upcoming reward at the next point in time. That prediction itself was kind of unexpected, and so it gives us a TD signal, a temporal differences signal, which is that delta that we saw in the equations. That is our model for dopamine, and this says that the model should be basically firing dopamine based on having learned that there's now a kind of unexpected input coming next. And in fact, um, that next input, the amount of dopamine for it was actually reduced. And we can kind of keep stepping through here. And what we see in the synaptic weights is a progression of increasing synaptic weights going kind of marching forward in time until we learn that the CS at this particular point in time is what's kind of predicting ultimately the reward coming later. And because there's nothing else happening in this layer, we have nothing else to sort of drive our prediction any, at any of our other earlier point in time. So in this case, 
this is the earliest reliable predictor of reward. And we can plot this on our graph here where we see uh, the temporal differences signal um, as a function of time on the x-axis. And as we step through entire kind of sequences or trials of these events, we see that the dopamine signal, which originally was firing here at the point of reward, has kind of continuously marched forward in time and is now firing at the time of the CS. And this signature, this kind of marching forward in time, is the kind of chaining property of the temporal difference learning. It reflects the fact that when you get something unexpected at time t, you learn about it at the immediately prior time, and so on and so on and so on. So it just kind of chains sort of backwards in time, so to speak, um, until it reaches the point at which it can't chain any further back, and then that's where it stays. Another important property that we're seeing here is that the uh, uh, peak size of this dopamine response uh, is reduced over time, and this has to do with a discount factor. That's the gamma in those equations we were looking at, which says essentially something that's further away in time is worth less to me than something that's available immediately. So the famous quote of Popeye or somebody. In... So we can reset this and uh, this is the current kind of state of the system now. And now we can introduce a um, uh, additional um, uh, stimulus and see how the dopamine responds to that. Okay, so now we're going to turn on a stimulus B at time step 2 that then goes off at time step 10 just when stimulus A turns on. Here's B, this other row, it gets active from 2 to 10, and then A turns on, okay, and because there's no gap between these two, this new stimulus serves essentially as a predictor for the second stimulus, which in turn is a predictor for the reward. And because of this kind of bucket carrying, kind of chaining dynamic that you see in temporal differences, we'll see that the reward will actually back up now into this reward prediction will back up into this even earlier stimulus. And so if we now look at, at how it plays out over trials of learning, we see that kind of same backward chaining creep of the, the, the TD signal earlier and earlier in time. And then ultimately, it still is kind of much smaller because of the discount factor it backs up against the uh, onset of that other additional stimulus. So just kind of extending that whole process backwards in time. Now for fun, it's interesting to see what might happen if we decide to actually turn off the reward itself. So what if we don't even get uh, our expected reward in the first place? So here we have our stimulus coming on. You can see the reward prediction kind of building up as it goes over trials. And this ramping up is due to the discount factor. What's going to happen at this point? Bitter disappointment. Uh, I didn't get my expected reward, right? And so you get this huge dip in dopamine. The system was predicting that you were going to get the reward, but you didn't get it. Right, and so that discrepancy, that error, that reward prediction error is negative. That's a, a, a dip in dopamine firing in the brain. Um, and when we go back and look at our graph, uh, we can see uh, this big dip here in uh, our dopamine graph. And so if we keep playing that forward, uh, keep iterating more and more trials, uh, we call these extinction trials, when we're no longer delivering the reward, you can see the same kind of characteristic TD chaining uh, kind of process and ultimately starts eating away at the response to the condition stimulus and eventually kind of erases the initial memory. Now, there's a several things about this model that are not accurate in terms of how the brain works. First of all, this kind of very tell 
telltale kind of characteristic chaining is very rarely, if ever, observed in the brain. And this is one of the sources of indication that, in fact, uh, the, the, the division between kind of CS level learning um, versus reward level learning may be supported by different brain systems. Uh, the other thing that doesn't happen is that uh, in this model, the extinction learning that's kind of getting rid of the predicted reward um, erases the memory entirely. But actually we know that the amygdala retains a memory of uh, reward associations and they can be kind of temporarily extinguished, but they often kind of come back spontaneously or as a result of other cues. Um, and so there's a, a very nice, uh, complex and interesting literature on how these um, fear memories in particular are often studied, but it works also for repetitive, kind of uh, positive valued reinforcement learning, that these things kind of can go away temporarily, but then come back. And so it seems like the brain is very much adapted to learn about how contextual influences sort of say, well, you know, I didn't get reward here today, but I've gotten it before. Maybe there was something you know weird about today, and I'm going to come back tomorrow and see if it works. You know, and so you you have, and it's probably adaptive to have this idea that you know if you did get reward somewhere, you probably there's probably something important about that location, and you shouldn't just forget about it if you just don't happen to get it in a couple of days. You need to retain those memories and think about maybe different contexts that may determine when you get that reward and when you don't.